Actress Joan Collins is, according to judges of beauty the world over, one of the most attractive imports yet to be sent to the United States from Britain. Joan comes from a theatrical family in England. Her mother was long a top music hall star. Her father still is a leading variety show booker and agent in London. Joan worked first as a photographer's model, which led to bit parts in British films and ultimately to Hollywood. In the past few years, her career has been a globe-hopping tour from one location to another, making films in such places as the Orient, an island in the South Pacific, in Europe, the West Indies, Southern Mexico, and occasionally in Hollywood. When she is making pictures in California, Joan Collins enjoys this view from her small house perched high in the hills overlooking Hollywood. Ah, the California scenery is indeed lush. Hello, Joan. Hello, Charles. Do you tend this garden yourself, or do the flowers flourish from your mere presence? <laughs> Not at all. This is the first garden I've ever owned, and I don't really even own it because it's a rented garden. As a matter of fact, I've never had a garden before, and I don't really do much with this at all. Not that you didn't even have a garden in England? No, I lived in flats or apartments all the time. You seem to hop from one continent to another in the work that you do. What place do you call home? Oh, I don't really know. Actually, I suppose I call California my real home because I've lived here for almost six years, and I'm a resident of California. But I still don't have any possessions. I don't have any furniture. I don't have a house. I don't have a car. I have a lot of suitcases, but that's about it. Well, I'm sure you find something stimulating and interesting wherever you go. I hope so. How high up in the hills are you here? Well, I think that we're about, um, oh, I don't know. It takes about five minutes to drive up here. Have you got used to driving uh, up mountains and things here in California? Yes, yeah, about 50 miles an hour. Quite dangerous. But as you can see, there's lots of houses up here. You can see they're all built on ledges like this. And then over here, we have our beautiful California smog. It's not too smoggy today, actually. Can you see it? Well, there's a sort of a haze. Yeah. That's better than usual. Can you see the Pacific Ocean from here? Oh, yes, I can. I can see it today. Can you see it? Yes, I think out there on the horizon. Yeah. Joan, are any of your family here to enjoy all this with you? No, I wish they were. My mother is coming out soon, but they all live in England. Uh, do most of the people whom you do see out here, are, are they in motion pictures too? Well, I think that everybody that lives in Los Angeles practically that I meet is connected in some way or another with motion pictures, even though it isn't always in the capacity of actors or actresses. But most of my friends are, yes. Well, I suppose you've been caught up in the Hollywood social world. <laughs> no. No? Really. I can't imagine that. Do you do a lot of entertaining here? Well, not exactly in the Elder Maxwell style, but, um, you see, the house is really too small to do too much, but I do do a little. As you can see, this is the rather small dining room, and this is the bar. And it's rather difficult to do any lavish kind of entertaining because nobody fits. So if anybody does come over here, they have to wear slacks and uh, be prepared to sit on the floor. Well, that's the best kind of party anyway. Joan, now that you're out here in Hollywood, do you find much difference between English and American actors? Um, yes, I, I do actually find quite a bit of difference, mostly in um, movie acting. I, I really think that American actors are better movie actors than British actors because they have a more realistic approach to acting and to portraying a character on the screen. I think that English actors, um, who are mostly trained for the stage, as I was, um, tend to become a little larger than life when they are on a movie screen. And, and that's why I think the great movie actors, all of them are American, and also some Russian ones. I, I saw one Russian film, and it was just fabulous, just marvelous film. Now, you say you were trained for the stage. That was in England? Yes. Where, where did you do your, your training? At the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. Ah, well, that's uh, considered the outstanding school, isn't it? Yes, I suppose it is. Were the instructors uh, pretty tough? <laughs> well, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art is more um, stresses the fact that everybody is to be a stage actor rather than a television or a radio or a movie actor. And I remember one of the um, end of term reports that I got, and um, it said, um, Miss Collins has certainly some talent and is a very attractive girl, but if she doesn't watch her projection, It'll be the films for her, and that would be such a pity. Oh, that's supposed to be bad. <laughs> yes, <laughs> terrible. Well, you certainly learned your lessons well. 
What are the future plans for Joan Collins? Well, I think that I would probably be able to tell you my future plans more, what I would be doing in a year from now, than what I would be doing a week from now. I think that um, my contract is coming to its end, thank goodness. I've been under contract, it seems, forever. And then I'll be a freelance. And I'll be able to choose the parts and the movies more than I have been able to do up, up to this point, because I've been under contract all the time. But uh, you must have something in mind. What kind of a part would you like to play? Oh, a marvelous part. Huh? Fabulous. Just some part that has everything in it. I actually would rather like to be a comedian. I did do one part in which I, I played a comedy, which is my favorite role to date. And I've never done another comedy, even though I've been insisting all the time that I should do comedy, that I am a comedian. And uh, one of these days I will, very soon. Well, it sounds to me as though you think that you've probably been uh, sort of typecast. Would you say that that's the main problem of being a beautiful Hollywood star? Well, I think that um, any, any girl in the business, whether she's in the theater or in radio or in television or in, in the stage or whatever, um, if she's attractive, she seems to have more of a problem of proving to the rest of the world that she is a good actress than if somebody is not so pretty. Because I think people have the mistaken idea that if you're pretty, um, it's terribly easy to become an actress. You're plucked from behind the soda fountain or from behind um, a drugstore and you're put under the screen, which happened 20 years ago and 30 years ago and quite recently, but it doesn't happen anymore. The public are wised up to that now and the public are um, much more sophisticated and much hipper than they were 10 years ago when they would accept bad acting and just accept seeing beautiful faces on the screen. Now they don't. And most of the really big actors and actresses are not what you call cover girls and boys. Not so much. There are a lot of them, but, but not as many as there used to be. Well, now, how do you fight uh, being typed as just a pretty girl who no one expects to act? Well, I don't really know. Um, I suppose you really, you try and do parts that are against your type. For instance, I played two very um, unusual parts. Not recently, a couple of years ago, I played a nun in a picture called Sea Wife, which nobody saw. And I played um, the part of an alcoholic who ran um, sort of a beat up bus station and spent most of her time drinking and had gone to sea and was fat and I had the fat clothes on and the ugly makeup and my hair was all over the place. And one tried to do it in this way. Mm. It's not my idea. I do not want to play nuns and alcoholics, uh, ugly alcoholics on the screen. Um, because I think that it, it, it was ludicrous. I, I didn't come off in the part because I was just completely wrong for them. Um, but I think the main thing is to get a good part and to prove that you can act. And that sounds so corny because everybody says it all the time. But that, well, that's you, know, it you know something that I've noticed, Joan? Often when I talk to beautiful actresses, the parts that they think back on that they especially like were ones in which they weren't pretty, like you playing the alcoholic and so mm -hmm. forth. Well, I didn't especially like that part. Joan, you've worked in several countries, uh, made pictures in various places. What's your favorite place? My favorite place for working or my favorite place for living? Well, both. Well, my favorite place for working is right here. I think it's the best place for working. I think the facilities for making motion pictures are much superior to anywhere, anywhere else in the world. And that includes London, where I started, and um, New York, where I've seen some movies being made. What about living? Well, for living, I'd like to um, switch myself between about four places. At the moment, I'm rather partial to living in Rome. I love Rome. I was there quite recently making a film, which is a terrible place to work in, I think, because of the conditions. But um, as far as the actual mode of living is concerned, I thought it was just marvelous. What did you like about it? Well, it's terribly relaxed, for one thing. I had just come from New York and I had been used to making 17 appointments a day and rushing around and just practically having a nervous breakdown. And in Rome, or in Italy, I was only in Rome, everybody is terribly relaxed. Nobody rushes. Everybody says, we'll do it tomorrow, which is my whole philosophy of life. Well, the Italians and, do know that secret, though. <laughs> yes, and the Spanish, all Latin countries, actually. And they have the three hours siesta in the afternoon. They eat dinner at what I consider a reasonable hour, which is about 9 or 9.30, because I never get up, well, that's another story. How, d how did you uh, adapt to the attitude of Italian men? Well, I think that any Western, yeah, Western, 
Western-type girl adapts quite easily to um, the attitude of Italian men. Italian men are terribly conscious of, of women. Not, they don't have to be beautiful, they don't have to be particularly young, just women. They are appreciative of women, which is a marvelous attitude to have. And they treat women with respect and with deference. And any woman, they treat as though she were a queen. M is, more so than American men do. I think so, and I think um, that this is maybe a fault of um, Western women. That By that I mean English, American. Oh? Uh, what, trying, a, what about American women? Well, I think that they, they try to be um, competitive with men. They try and be their equal. They try and beat them at sports, which I think is just ghastly. I mean, who wants to beat a man at golf? And they try and get up there and do all the, you know, women, um, not women presidents, but women, um, what do you call them? Not senators. Mm -hmm. Senators. And um, women are really, as far as I can see, trying to put themselves on a par with men. They don't do this in Italy. Women do have jobs, but they don't have jobs that are equal to men. And I think that if women want to um, be treated as feminine creatures, which they are, that they have to say, well, I'm just going to be a woman, and I'm not going to try and beat him at tennis, because no man wants to be beaten at tennis anyway. You're absolutely right. Joan, it was wonderful to see you. Thank <laughs> you for letting us come. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ladies of the ensemble, for your edification. <laughs> the Ritz brothers out of work. I say, what's next on the agenda? The next actress award. Miss Lansley? Miss Collins? Yes, yes Miss Winter. Winter. Are we up for anything? The only thing we're up for, darling, is grab. Oh, these Americans. Suppose it could possibly have anything to do with that Boston tea party. Oh, no, dear. You're batting a very sticky wicket. True. After all, they did nominate our darling Deborah. And their darling David. Their David? I thought that he was one of ours. Not anymore. We traded him in for Doug Fairbanks. <laughs> oh, well. Chin's up. <laughs> Not to be nominated, good show. Not to be nominated, jolly. Not to sit and not pretend. It's over in a minute. And if you didn't win it, it's love to let the winner never fail. In every art house, you'll find the great of us, the great and the nearly great of us. With the noble J. Arthur Rank controlling the fate of us. It's river not to be trying for it, smashing not to be buying for it. Come on, performance, that's something else again. You have to be most fortunate to get the proper part. A role like Susan's nose or shells, which proves you know your art. A role that's really lonesome but still has a lot of heart. Whatever the sense. Well, then, it's bully not to be nominated, wither not to be nominated, fun to be just all so ran. Oh, there's Susan Hayworth. Hello. She didn't let Walter Wenger down. Susan Hayworth? I didn't even know she was back in town. Oh, there's Shirley McLean. There's a talent that's rare. If you like juvenile delinquent hair. Oh, look, there's Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Tell me, darling, what's she got? I'm kidding. What do you think made the tin roof so hot? <laughs> oh, there's Rosalind Russell. What a marvelous day. <laughs> Your mother could have scored as Auntie Mae. <laughs> well, I guess that covers every star. But, darling, we forgot a Deborah. Deborah Paget? No, dear. Deborah Carr. It's bully not to be nominated. Tonto not to be nominated. Capital not to wear the bony grin. And now, with your permission, we'll dispense with birth and bring you greetings from the land that gave us birth and tell you that next year we'll cry for all. Not to be 